This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. Anyone else losing fights with seasonal allergies? Yeah, that's me. Pollen is beating me like a speed bag today. Anyway, here's what we got for y'all. Tonight we go on the ground in India where soaring COVID infection rates have overwhelmed the nation's healthcare system. Then as US troops finally pull out of Afghanistan, we look at how a rapid invasion turned into America's longest war. But first, here's what you need to know right now. The Biden administration plans to begin reuniting migrant families that were separated at the border under the Trump administration, starting with four families this week. The parents will return to the U.S. on what's called humanitarian parole, while the Department of Homeland Security weighs whether to grant longer-term immigration status. This is welcome news for immigration advocates, but they say way more needs to be done. More than 1,000 families have yet to be reunited, and for some, it's been years. This comes as the Biden administration faces criticism from both sides of the aisle for its handling of a record high migration surge at the southern border. Back in January, Newsy spoke to a father who was separated from his child. Yo vi cuando le quitaban sus niños a los padres, a las madres del cuello, a la fuerza. Eso fue muy triste. Uno como padre lo, lo estamos viviendo también, pero just last month, apprehensions at the border hit a 15-year high. Following up on its promise, the administration has drastically reduced the number of unaccompanied minors it holds in jail-like border sites. New numbers out today show there are only 605 children in Customs and Border Protection facilities, down from nearly 6,000 earlier this year. The government is moving those minors to a growing network of emergency shelters operated by the Department of Health and Human Services. Nearly 23,000 children in these shelters are still waiting to be released and reunited with parents or relatives. Whenever most folks hear the term greenhouse gases, they might picture something like this. What you see is water vapor, though there is some CO2 in there too. But there's another earth warming chemical that is thousands of times more potent. Today, the Environmental Protection Agency took steps to limit hydrofluorocarbons, also known as HFCs, which is what I'm gonna stick to calling them. HFCs are typically used in refrigeration and air conditioning. The new regulation aims to reduce the production and importation of HFCs by 85% over the next 15 years. The EPA estimates that by 2050, that would eliminate more than 4.5 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide. This marks the first time the federal government has set national limits on HFCs. More than a dozen states have already banned them or implemented some kind of restriction. It's all in line with Biden's ambitious goals to slow global warming. You know that end game goal we've been working towards since the vaccines became a reality? Well, turns out herd immunity is not likely to happen. Instead, health experts now believe COVID-19 will eventually become a manageable threat, which will continue to circulate in society, but in much smaller numbers, just like the old fashioned flu. This isn't a total shock considering COVID variants and vaccine hesitancy put a limit on how much good the vaccines could do. At this time, more than 44% of the US population has received at least one vaccine. But according to the CDC, nearly 8% of those people skipped their second dose. Then there's still roughly 25% of the population that hasn't had a single shot yet. While variants are circulating in the US, the country has not been as hard hit as other places, in part because of its vaccine rollout. The differing impacts of COVID paint a stark contrast between developed and developing countries. India currently accounts for one in three new COVID cases in the world. Multiple states in the country are planning to go into a complete lockdown this week. Cases there started rising in February, but the situation has progressively worsened over the last month. A freelancer for Newsy spoke with doctors in Mumbai about the problem and what went wrong with the handling of the second wave. This is the war room of one of the largest COVID care centers in Mumbai city. Doctors are working round the clock, monitoring the health of their patients, but with a looming sense of hopelessness. Like many other hospitals across the country, these doctors are overwhelmed and struggling to save lives. And that's primarily because they're running out of oxygen and other medical supplies. But when those small nursing homes and hospitals ran out of oxygen, ran out of venti, and they had no supply of emergency drugs, 
we were uh, asked to take up these patients. So, of course, we took up everyone whom we could. But these patients who came in at the last moment, they were the ones who were very critical and uh, the fatality was seen in those uh, patients. In less than a month, Mumbai city alone recorded over 60,000 active COVID cases. The situation in India's capital, Delhi, is much worse. Crematoriums are overcrowded, with dead bodies piling up by the hour. The healthcare system in every major city in India is crumbling under the rising second wave of COVID-19. Medical supplies are running out. There is an acute shortage of oxygen in hospital beds. Vaccines are in limited supply. And all the frontline workers are completely burnt out. But the government still insists there is no need to panic and the situation is under control. The Indian government is facing some serious criticism for this slow response to this new surge of COVID cases. It's as if they weren't expecting a second wave at all. You know, the government did not learn, neither the central and many state governments. Uh, they, they failed to recruit more health workers. They failed to increase the number of oxygen beds, uh, which the governments really had a whole year to improve upon. The only hope in this fight against COVID are the vaccines. But those two are in short supply in India. After standing for hours in long queues, people are being turned away from such centers with little information on when vaccines will be available next. The government's preparedness to face the second wave seems to be inappropriate or in, uh, insufficient. We have a lot of uh, relatives, friends, uh, everyone getting uh, affected by this uh, uh, phase. There is also a growing sense of confusion around the official numbers shared by the government. Experts say that the government's official numbers don't match the grim reality on the ground. Unfortunately, our Indian government has uh, either undermined or has neglected to um, sort of uh, be, in, um, uh, be updated with these things. The impact of the second wave of COVID-19 has been brutal for India and it looks like it will only get much worse before it gets any better. Until then, it's a long and uphill battle for those working on the front line of this pandemic. In Mumbai, Pracheta Sharma for Newsy. When you're back, I'll tell you about some of the trending items that have totally gotten me off task today. I mean, it doesn't take much, but still. Fortnite is back in the news and no, it's not about new characters or emote announcements. Here's what's trending. The company behind the colorful multiplayer battle royale took their fight with Apple into a virtual courtroom Monday. Here's what that sounded like. No, 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 no. They really like, oh my God, Apple is such a monopoly because they didn't have, they didn't have iMessage and Android. Basically, the virtual courtroom line got hacked there, so not off to a great start. Anyway, Epic Games, the company behind Fortnite, sued Apple in 2020 after Fortnite got the boot from Apple's App Store. The game maker wanted to give customers an alternate payment system within the game that would bypass Apple's system, which takes 30% from in-app purchases. This set up a pretty creative callback opportunity for Fortnite. After getting the boot from the App Store, they put out an ad featuring an ominous big brother with an apple for it head that mimics Apple's 1984 ad. The trial will determine whether Apple is a monopoly within its own app store, which is a claim from Epic Games. Something to look out for, in the course of this trial, we could find out for the first time how much money the app store actually makes. And for the record, I doubt they'll disclose that in Fortnite V-Bucks, just a hunch. Verizon is trending after selling off AOL and Yahoo for $5 billion, which is about $4 billion less than what they bought those companies for. Verizon initially purchased AOL and Yahoo to get into the online media and ad business and take on big players like Amazon, Google, and Facebook. But things did not work out so well, and now Verizon is basically getting out of the digital media business altogether. The company said in a release that the move will help accelerate growth for long-term success, whatever that means. Verizon will still hold on to a 10% stake and the deal is expected to close in the second half of this year. Honestly, didn't need much coffee this morning after watching Marvel's new sizzle reel, which was three minutes and 10 seconds of pure emotion. On your left. 
This Marvel celebration of cinema was a Mjolnir strike to the feels. It also gave us a sneak peek at what's coming down the pike for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The biggest reveals? The Black Panther sequel called Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Actual footage from the Eternals. And whoa, Nelly, was that a Fantastic Four logo? We're gonna do this again, huh? <sighs> All right then. 2020 was a rough year for movie theaters and the MCU. It was the first time since 2009 there weren't any Marvel films released. A lot of us are looking forward to getting back to the theaters and if this teaser is any indication, the MCU will be there waiting for us. Back in April, President Biden said he was ending America's so-called forever war and withdrawing all US troops from Afghanistan. It's a milestone for sure, considering troops have been there for two decades. But how exactly did we get here? Newsy's Meg Hilling gives us a timely recap of the war in Afghanistan. May 1st is the beginning of the end of nearly 20 years of U.S. military conflict in Afghanistan. It's time to end America's longest war. It's time for American troops to come home. By September 11th, President Joe Biden says the roughly 2,500 American forces remaining in the country will pull out. It marks the closing of a deadly and costly chapter in U.S. history that began with the 9-11 attacks in 2001. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. Less than a month after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, President George W. Bush announced the U.S. would go to war in Afghanistan, a mostly mountainous Asian nation some 7,000 miles away. The objectives? Punish the Al-Qaeda terrorist organization behind the attacks and remove from power the Taliban leaders protecting them. More than two weeks ago, I gave Taliban leaders a series of clear and specific demands. Close terrorist training camps, hand over leaders of the Al-Qaeda network, and return all foreign nationals, including American citizens, unjustly detained in your country. None of these demands were met. And now, the Taliban will pay a price. The United Kingdom, France, and others quickly pledged forces to support the U.S. in Operation Enduring Freedom. Dozens of other countries helped in other ways, like intel sharing. And on the ground, a coalition of Afghan militias led a majority of the initial combat as partners of the U.S. Throughout November, Taliban strongholds were seized by these forces. With December came the foundation for the creation of a new Afghan government, as well as the fall of Kandahar, the last remaining Taliban stronghold. The swearing in of Hamid Karzai as head of the country's interim government closed out 2001. Operation Anaconda in March 2002 would mark a rocky start as the first big ground assault by U.S. forces and its Afghan allies against Taliban fighters. From there, U.S. officials began shifting their attention towards restructuring the country and helping create an Afghan army. By helping to build an Afghanistan that is free from this evil and is a better place in which to live, we are working in the best traditions of George Marshall. NATO would go on to take lead of the International Security Assistance Force with the objective of enabling the new government to protect itself and prevent terrorists from using the country as a safe haven in the future. But any steadiness Afghanistan had gained began to fade in 2006 as violence from insurgents increased. Suicide attacks skyrocketed compared to the previous year, while the country's developing security forces struggled to gain a foothold. By 2007, members of NATO debated whether the country's security should be handed over to Afghanistan's government or if more troops from abroad should be deployed, the U.S. leaning heavily towards the latter. I will not allow terrorists to plot against the American people from safe havens halfway around the world. Under President Barack Obama, more troops were sent as Taliban insurgency and violence grew. Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al Qaeda. Almost a decade into the war, the killing of the mastermind behind the 9-11 attacks raised hope. Obama announced plans to withdraw troops from the country. But violence continued as U.S. and NATO once again found themselves debating how to wind down the war and hand control of security over to the country. Ultimately, it is up to the people of Afghanistan to take ownership of their future, to govern their society, and to achieve 
and everlasting peace. Entering the White House in 2017, President Donald Trump found his plans for a swift exit from the war disrupted amid continued surges in violence and delayed talks with the Taliban. We're bringing our soldiers back from Afghanistan, all coming back. Under President Biden, a final withdrawal has begun, with September 11th the target date for completing the pullout of the last American troops, months after President Trump's goal of May 1st. I'm now the fourth United States president to preside over American troop presence in Afghanistan. Two Republicans, two Democrats. I will not pass this responsibility onto a fifth. For Newsy, I'm Mag Hilling. If you feel like your mental health has suffered during the pandemic, there's good news. Experts say we can rebuild that. Quick vibe check for the folks out there. How y'all doing? I'm all right, thanks for asking, assuming that you all did ask about me too. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and the pandemic has really put a spotlight on our mental well-being. Because of that, we're exploring mental health through a new series called Breakthrough. In this installment, Newsy's Lindsay Thies tells us how we can rebuild our mental health after a year of pandemic-related stress. This pandemic isn't fully over yet, and it has already taken so much from so many people, time, jobs, livelihoods, loved ones. But the good news is experts say that this trauma we have all suffered from the pandemic is a thing we can all heal from. I really do feel like we're gonna see a lot more trauma disorders that come out of this. In a pandemic, we're exposed to stress or maybe more likely to develop a a, a, a mental health issue. Collective suffering, mass trauma, pandemic PTSD, whatever you call it, a shared terrible event can leave people feeling powerless. Don't ignore that so you can heal, experts say. Broadly put, trauma is something that overwhelms our ability to cope. It overwhelms our senses and leaves us feeling helpless and unsafe. Nothing replaces getting an individual medical opinion, but sometimes getting to that step may require help, especially if you notice it in someone close to you. Approach the subject um, in a way that you can have an open dialogue about mental health, and you can phrase it in a way like, you know, I saw this on television, and it's a lot of people that are experiencing difficulties right now because of the pandemic. You know, have you thought about that? What are your thoughts about going to therapy? Regardless of what your experience is, regardless of what your identities are, I encourage you to honor them, make space for them, and practice self-care. Lindsay Thies, Newsy, San Francisco. If you haven't done so already, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. I don't know if social media is a physician-approved form of stress relief, but I'm there anyway. When it comes to gun violence per capita, Alabama is one of the country's most dangerous states. But the conversation around guns in the state goes beyond safety. It often focuses on something many of us have taken advantage of during the pandemic, the great outdoors. National reporter Dan Grossman has more. In the vast landscape that envelops the furthest corners of Alabama, just a minor slope. Marianne Hudson feels at home. It's the perfect storm of, of moisture, canopy and shade conditions. I've always been one who felt like you enjoy the world around you the more that you know about it. If there is something to discover. I came down here to look for a snake and I found uh, some snake evidence she will find it. The male have these, has these brilliant metallic blue. And if there's a correlation to understand about these lands and its inhabitants. She will explain it. Guns in America and their purchase and their sale have a lot to do with our ability to conserve wildlife. 
just as the relationship between these wild species is very interconnected with predator and prey, so does the effect of the funding on these resources. In 1934, the United States passed the Federal Aid in Wildlife Restoration Act, commonly known as the Pittman-Robertson Act. It mandated that each year, 10% of pistol and revolver sales, 11% of firearms and ammunition sales, and 11% of bows and archery sales would go to the Secretary of the Interior as a way to fund conservation efforts across the country. Think of it like a big pot of money that states would only then be able to access based on the number of hunting and fishing licenses it sold that year. It means for the last 87 years, a majority of the work to protect endangered species, their habitats, and the lands we all enjoy hasn't been funded through income taxes, but these. It's a fact that we try to push uh, anytime that we do a hunter uh, education class. Uh, we've also started our, some firearms one-on-one -on -one classes. Jason McHenry is a sergeant with the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. His salary is funded with that money, as is upkeep of this and every other Alabama state-owned gun range. I think it's paramount that they understand that it gives them as citizens buy-in, you know, to understand that not only am I just buying a license to, uh, I guess you could say, have a check in the box and, and know that I'm obeying, I guess, the law and regulation, but that I'm also, as a citizen of Alabama, directly impacting conservation efforts. This model is not unique to Alabama. It is followed by every state in the country. For the last several years, federal money given to states for conservation has fluctuated between $600 million and $800 million. But with talks of new gun regulations revived in Washington, that number could go down next year if legislation is passed. The beauty here is innate. These types of places and the things you can hear and see out here provide basically some type of ability to meet the human need for connection to the wild. But the stewards of this land understand its preservation relies on a connection much more complicated than the simplicity you might find here. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with more in the loop. Same time, same place. Top stories from Newsy are headed your way right now.